Uh, no, you won't be in the middle. You'll either be, yes. Uh, it uh, levels the playing field for candidates, your candidate status here. So, sorry, but. I don't care where I sit. Yes. Um, <laughs> sir, you're the last one here, so you're right here on the, the end, and we're just getting started, yeah. so welcome. Thank you. So this is um, this is new. This uh, we have not done this before. Um, but um, after the last election, we recognize that there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation that gets communicated out there during the election season. And so uh, staff has to remain uh, politically neutral. We don't get involved in the campaigns, um, but we are notorious for correcting disinformation and misinformation on our website uh, under the heading of the Department of Corrections. <laughs> and so um, uh, we uh, uh, and uh, we don't point back where it came from, but we like the public to understand what's accurate and what's not. Um, I have a couple sayings. Um, uh, the staff um, and our elected officials know it, um, which is um, don't allow the facts to get in the way of a good story. If it's news, it's news to us because folks just make up things. Uh, and if your um, mom says she loves you, um, uh, verify it and get in writing. <laughs> um, so you've got before you a, um, a, um, a, an agenda. And so what we'll do is give, I, I know some of you all may not have met each other, so I'll give you the opportunity to just do a brief uh, introduction. Um, and then we'll move through um, the staff and the departments. And then we'll open it up to questions. Um, and the questions, the goal here is, is as you're out campaigning, there will be questions coming up. We want you to know the answers or know who and how to get the answers um, effectively. And the first thing that you'll learn as an elected official is that you work through your city administrator, and that's me. Um, and that's not because it's a power struggle. People think it is. But we have what's called a charter. The charter is the law, and it's issued by the state of Oregon. So take it up with them. Every city has a charter. Cities are not mentioned in the state constitution. We actually get our authority through the state legislature and counties actually are created as an arm of the state. And so, um, and uh, from there, before I get into anything else, we'll go ahead and allow each of you all to introduce yourselves to each other, but also to uh, staff. Just start and go down, man. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I'm Tim Slater. I'm, uh, I came here uh, to be a warehouser forester. I was part of Timberlands for about 35 years. Uh, most of my time was, was wrapped around dealing with people, agencies, land use planning, uh, creating new projects, and so on and so on. So that's how I got people involved. And I asked the city administrator one time, is we were in a meeting, but uh, I, I've got a question for you. And he said, was it about being on the uh, council vacancy? No, but tell me about that. So anyhow, I've had the opportunity to serve before. I think we've done uh, a whole variety of wonderful things Done that. Uh, most recently, I was the uh, executive director of the area chamber of commerce. And, there's a variety of other things, uh, Army Reserve, County Commanders, uh, uh, County um, Planning Commission, so on and so on. So I believe it that. Very rounded. Yep. Happy Good to see day. you again. Susanna Nordoff, um, Bachelor of Arts in Urban Planning and Geography and Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Moved down here from Vancouver, Washington after a couple of years in civil engineering to take a job locally. Have had um, some experience with public works types of projects, uh, both for private development and for city development. Reviewed um, plans for different jurisdictions that came into the Dyer Partnership to see if they were uh, per the city ordinance at the time. And I remember stopping one that was from a, um, a ocean spray cranberries and, and it didn't it, it had to do with uh, the pH and you have to check your industrial ordinance to make sure that things comply so um, I'm retired for civil engineering and I, I've been here for 20 years I enjoy the community 
um, and have been involved, because uh, I own property in Gardner, I was on the, the sanitary board of directors for five and a half years, and we put a new line under the Umpqua River during that time, we replaced pump stations during that time, so it was pretty hopping uh, tour of duty, I would say. I also served on the fire board of directors for Gardner for two years and got them automatic garage door openers. So that was that was kind of a really good good feel to leave a community in better shape than you find it. So I'm the incumbent at this point and I'm running again. Thank you. Hi, my name is Harry Haynes and uh, I'm, I went through junior high school here in Coos Bay North Bend area and then uh, my folks moved us to Spokane. I still mad at them for that because I had to spend nine years up there in the heat and the snow and uh, couldn't wait to get back here. I uh, came back in 91 and uh, uh, I just love this area and I'd like to see things moving forward. Um, I'm, I'm the local manager for Zipply Fiber and uh, since I've been back, I've, I'm an ex-equipment operator and uh, I was a lineman for the phone company for uh, about 19 years and my legs and my back were worn out from climbing poles and falling off the poles and doing all of that so they talked me into taking a management job and still not sure if I made the right decision but here I am. So. Um, Never been in politics or, or run for any office, um, but I do like to help in moving things forward. So that's why I'm here. All right, and then running for mayor. Running for mayor. So council, council, mayor. Council. And so <clears throat> I'm Matt Hamilton. Um, I'm currently on the North Bend City Council. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, I traveled around the United States for 20 years doing projects superintendent in oil companies, uh, <clears throat> uh, chemical plants, the farm industry, ethanol industry, uh, all the big, all the big type stuff. Uh, I was over, in, I've been overseas working in Kazakhstan, and, um, did all kinds of that stuff. I ended up coming here because of the GMA project, and uh, uh, I'm currently working at West Coast Contractors. I'm a project administrator there. Um, yeah, it's my experience on city council so far, it's been great. It's, uh, it's fun to see the inner workings of the city and how things get done and how we can get things done and the ideas that come from that. So, uh, want to run again, so here I am. Um, hi everyone, my name is Melinda Torres. I grew up in the area, graduated from high school from Bandon. Um, I went to school, uh, my background is in public health with a focus in uh, research and data. Um, my primary focus that I do in the um, community right now is just really uh, focus on kids at risk, homeless, and foster care. That's where my passion is and um, working with um, housing and trying to get our families uh, better sustainability with our housing programs and stuff in the area. Um, and this is my first time running, and I'm just really excited about this opportunity and trying to uh, create like a better uh, future for our children and families in North Bend. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Jessica Ingleke. I'm the current mayor for the city of North Bend. I grew up in the area, and um, I did leave after high school for a few years, lived overseas and up and down the west coast and the east coast, and. There's no place like home. So I came back in 2010 to raise my daughters. Um, I'm almost done with that. And, um, you know, when I came back in 2010, I wanted to make sure that I got involved in the area. So one of the first things that I did was I joined the Chamber of Commerce. And I was also a, um, a, the president of the chamber in 2017. And I'm really active in um, various different boards throughout the community. Um, CCD is a certified development company, I'm involved in that, um, and um, so I am running for, I was counselor for two years, and then I was um, elected as mayor in 2020. I've served two full terms, and I've decided that it's been wonderful to see everything moving forward and want to keep that momentum, so I am running for re-election, and um, I'm happy to be here today. All right. 
Thank you. All right, so um, I know lunch has um, um, gotten here, and, and one thing I always learn is um, don't get in the way of uh, you all eating and, and us talking because you won't really pay attention. And so uh, feel free, you all can come down, uh, grab a plate, uh, go ahead and fix your plate, and then we'll um, uh, finish out with the staff stuff, and staff will go behind you, um, but we'll go ahead um, and uh, continue the program. So come on down. I would say you don't want to be the speaker right before lunch, and you don't want to be the last speaker of the day. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and put this piece of paper in our thumbs up there. We'll try to do it in order. Let's see how it sounds here. Okay, we'll use directions. Well, finance, you go first. Yeah, Jim. Jim, can you tell her that? Yeah, so we're going to start our handout. We're going to start with our handout. And when I decided to step out of being mayor, I made it. Well, you know, I've done my best to eliminate that when I, when I first left the office in uh, 1998. I had all of the budgets in binders for that, so I kept the last and the first and eliminated all that out of the attic. And then uh, I carry quite a bit, and I do have some tattoos. All right, so in order to try to keep us on time and get you out of here by 1 o'clock, as they say, um, 1 p.m. versus 1 a.m., um, uh, you'll have handouts. Um, mine is attached to the agenda. First thing uh, that folks ask is the form of the government, and that's the most confusing folks, uh, the most confusing things for uh, folks. 
When you're out there, uh, everybody believes that because they've elected you to office that you can accomplish everything. So the first thing of the rule uh, that we uh, uh, try to convey is um, simple rules that you learned in elementary school. Can you count to four? Uh, the reason for four is it takes you, if you're in the seat, plus three others to accomplish anything duly assembled as a governing body. So although the mayor is a member of the council, uh, she's the head of the council, she's the face of the city, she's the uh, spokesperson for the council, not the city. Um, she has specific, um, uh, uh, or that person, I shouldn't uh, genderize it uh, since it's a candidate, but the mayor has specific duties um, broken out by the charter. And that's very simple. Uh, runs the meetings, um, uh, signs anything authorized by the council, uh, has ceremonial duties, uh, and then speaks for the council. Individual members do not speak for the council. The second is you have authority duly assembled, and so those are what we call charter. And in the charter, uh, the council has one and only one employee, and that's the city administrator. The city administrator is a contract employee. Um, I have what's called a perpetual contract. Um, my base contract actually runs through September of 2026, and then it automatically renews every year thereafter, unless the council um, gives notification uh, that they're not going to renew it. Um, what is the role of the city manager? The city manager implements all of the council policy. And obviously, I don't do it by myself. I delegate. And so collectively, that's how we accomplish uh, policy. We have what's called a council manager form of government. There's different types of government. Uh, for instance, in the county, you have a commission form of government where the commissioners um, actually uh, manage the day-to-day -day operations. Members of the governing body don't manage anything. Uh, they have one employee. Um, and that is with limited oversight, and so duly assembled is where we interact. And then I am judged and based annually based on a, uh, an evaluation process, and it is tied heavily towards the annual goals that the governing body sets as a two-year process. Um, I have what's called delegated authority, which means that because of the charter and the ordinances, that as a city administrator, if you were to break out who has more sort of day-to-day -day authority, the city administrator does, but I get that duly through the charter and the ordinances established by policy by the governing body. So at the top, you have the voters, then you have the council, uh, and then you have the manager, and then we have the department heads. Um, there are what's called strong mayor forms of government and weak mayor forms of government. That has nothing to do with the individual whatsoever. It's the structure of the government. We are what's called a weak form of, of mayor form of government, and that's because the mayor doesn't have veto power. She is a member, he or she is a member of the governing body and has a vote just like anybody else. Um, but they also control the agenda once it's handed off with the authority of the governing body to uh, run the meetings. Um, and they have the additional duties as I've mentioned uh, there. Um, in the packet, you don't have to look at it now, but it actually gives you um, uh, the charter uh, job description uh, and authority of the city administrator. Uh, so for instance, a lot of folks don't realize I'm code enforcement, I'm building official, I'm finance, everything. The reality is, is that when the charter was set, um, those then become delegated authority. So no, I'm not out doing code enforcement and all of these other things. Um, I have no law enforcement authority um, under the charter, and so that's um, uh, separate and distinct. Also in here is, um, you'll see the 2023 through 2025 strategic priorities and goals. Once the uh, new council is uh, certified and we go through a uh, swearing in uh, ceremony, we will then schedule um, an orientation for the new council members. Uh, it gets a little bit more in depth. 
Um, and then we actually schedule with the council a strategic priorities and goals session. That's because every two years we do this. So every two years we've gone through this process. What is different this go round is we actually will have the Caraggio group, which is an outside group. We received a grant uh, to pay for 50% to have a professional outside firm come in. This is um, uh, a, a collab collaborative effort with the League of Cities. And we will actually have an outside group work with the staff and the council on the strategic goals. Uh, and so, and then we will do regular updates as we have. Um, each year, um, we go through uh, the goals. Um, the city administrator uh, does a self-evaluation, gives a status update. Um, this most recent time, each staff uh, department head actually um, uh, participated in that process and listed everything that that department did uh, tied to the goals. If you look at our agendas, uh, you'll notice that on all the agendas, there is a section that says um, policy. The policy of agenda items should tie back to the strategic goals. Otherwise, why are we putting it before the city council? So that's me. We're going to hold questions. And supposedly they said if we go in order, I'm not sure which order. So does that mean I'm going to go down the left and then to the right? So that means finance is up. And so, Jeff, if you want to, you got the table here. I stood up because I'm over here all the time. Um, and staff, if you haven't, get your lunch. Um, and Jeff, you got the floor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Jeff Bridgens. I'm the finance director for the city. I'm also a CPA. Been with the city for about a year and a half now. Prior to being at the city, I was finance director for the housing authority in Lane County for about six years. Uh, prior to that, um, about 20 years of experience as an auditor of state and local governments um, throughout the United States. Um, I've prepared a brief handout, looks like this, um, just to give you an idea of uh, the finance department. Um, we're at three and a half positions, or FTE. I've got, we've got two and a half accounting uh, techs um, budgeted. Right now, we're operating at just two. Um, and then myself, so we're a fairly uh, small crew. On a, on a daily um, basis, we're taking in all of the deposits and getting them recorded. And we're taking in all of the, or making all of the disbursements and getting, making sure those go out um, and, and that the bills get paid. Um, we also process payroll. We're on a bi-weekly uh, schedule, so every two weeks, my department's processing payroll. Um, for the city and then um, we take care of a, a lot of other responsibilities that just kind of happen in the day-to-day -day of uh, working at City Hall. So we answer phones, um, we take reservations for the community center. So just all these kind of little ancillary things that come up um, occur in our department. Um, in terms of our reporting responsibilities, um, our fiscal year end is a June 30 fiscal year end. Um, we're responsible for, and the city has its financial statements um, audited every single year. And so um, that typically happens in the summer and fall uh, period each year. And so um, that's well underway right now. Um, in the winter springtime, where we develop and uh, move the process through for the city's annual budget. So it kind of splits up into those two really big reporting areas. Um, we facilitate a lot of grant reporting. The city's been receiving a lot of grants in the last few years, and with that comes a lot of extra duties with, re with regard to reporting. Um, we take in a lot of, we do a lot of special request reporting, for instance, um, when projections are needed, for instance, like let's say a collective bargaining agreement. That's when we'll look at and project out salaries to see if what the city can afford in, in those negotiations. And so it's an example of that. And then for any of the um, items that are put forth by finance to the city council, they, they're in a legislative file, there's usually support and things um, that are built into that. And so we're, we're handling that as well. Um, the next page, I've just prepared a really brief summary of the city of North Bend's budget. Um, the city of North Bend, is its budget is comprised of 26 different funds. And so that's like 26 different sets of books to account for the resources for each of those, um, e the purposes of each of those funds. 
the city's general fund is the main operating fund of the city. So that's, that's the big one that you want to be aware of. It accounts for approximately 37.1% of the city's expenditures um, occur in the general fund. The remainder of the budget is for restricted purposes. Um, and they consist primarily of wastewater, stormwater operations, tourism, streets, library, um, pool, and then any other special purpose grants um, that, that we uh, obtain in the, during the year. Um, the next page is a, uh, shows a projection, and this is a, a section taken from the fiscal year 25 budget, and it is a representation of the revenues and expenditures of the city's general fund. So you can see in this graphic, the general fund expenditures exceed on an annual basis, the general fund's revenues. So right now we're running at about a million dollar deficit per year in the general fund. Now you might say, well, how can we do that? We do have reserves, but every year that we're running a deficit, we're eating into those. And so this projection um, I did for the, the current year uh, budget, just to start showing that projection. So um, folks that are charged with governance can start making decisions and being informed about where the city's finances truly lay. Um, what also, um, last page here, um, there's also some unfunded items that are, I think, kind of like major items or major things that um, the city faces that really don't show up anywhere other than like the, we know that these are things that we have to plan for. Um, we estimate, for instance, that it would take $60 million in excess of to repair and repave all of the city streets. So you can see, obviously, if the general fund's running at a deficit, we don't have $60 million um, available to us. Um, the pool operating levy expires in two years, and the pool historically has ran deficits of $250,000 or greater annually. Currently, there's a pool special levy that's helping sub subsidize those operations. Once it expires, it's the general fund that has to absorb that if it's not re-upped by the citizens. Um, the city has an unfunded pension liability of approximately $7 million. That's an estimate that changes every year, but as of our last audited financial statements, that was the number that we reported. Um, and then um, we also have um, $60 million of backlog of sewer-related deferred maintenance that we estimate would need another $2 million per year on top of what we already receive to begin eating into that deferred maintenance on our uh, stormwater system. So with that, um, we'll hold on the questions at questions the end. Hold on to the end, okay. And so um, we'll call out the police department next, but if there's anybody who wants seconds or anything, don't hesitate to like get them. It's all casual, so. Okay. All right. Oh, I got a quick one. The unfunded liability is that principally the PERS issue? It's PERS and plus one other city pension, yes, sir. Okay. Hello, I'm Cal Mitz. I'm the police chief, and your police department also here with me today is our captain, uh, Ed Perry. Uh, I didn't print out a an actual handout just wanted to talk to you i've got some talking points what's that <laughs> so uh, and the reason why i have talking points is that i have a history of taking up the fire department's time because i start to talk <laughs> and i get excited so <laughs> anyway i will make copies of these talking points and provide you with those as well uh, so your police department has a total staff right now 16 sworn officers with uh one uh, actually a new one actually being sworn in next monday so the 16 sworn officers, uh, two of them are the management, as I introduced myself, and the captain. We have four patrol sergeants. Uh, we have eight patrol officers, one community resource officer, and this officer is basically our homeless liaison, deals with the homeless uh, population uh, in our city and connects them and uh, daily with uh, resources and provides them with a list of resources uh, 
his job typically begins in the morning in our designated camping areas uh, um, where most of our homeless population where we like to have our homeless population uh, and making sure that those areas are policed up and and that the those areas actually have specific times that people can camp there and then they need to be moving along by the time in the next morning <clears throat> also we have one school resource officer right now officer jared jennig uh, works with all of our schools uh, it's a big job because we have one school in our school district that's actually uh, in the hauser area at north bay uh, we currently have uh, one vacant detective position uh, and we also have a vacant second, which is a new position for us, a second SRO, which the school district will be paying 100% from. We have one records specialist, one evidence technician. Uh, these gals are basically the glue that keeps us all together. Uh, very important positions there. Uh, and we have one community service officer, uh, half-time public works uh, and codes enforcement. This community service officer is a non-sworn position, uh, and Josh Nowatney is our current one. He's the one that's actually gonna be sworn in as a police officer, and we just recently hired uh, Jason Croft as our newest uh, community service officer, or CSO. He's the one that drives a gray Toyota pickup around. Uh, he deals with a lot of uh, codes issues to include parking enforcement downtown, works hand in hand very closely with the community resource officer uh, with homeless issues. Uh, and then also works on any types of codes, city codes with public works. So it's a half, half time funded both through public works as well as the police department. Uh, we have three current uh, reserve police officers. Uh, one of them is a retired police officer with North Bend and then two reserve officers that have a history of, uh, of varying in years uh, with the police department and the city. So <clears throat> what does this represent for you as far as uh, public safety? We serve a population, as you all are aware, I'm sure, of about 10,000 people, depending on uh, which uh, version of the census that you read. It kind of fluctuates within about two or 300 people, it seems like. Uh, over 18,000 calls for service in 2023. We have a fairly uh, busy call load for our officers. Uh, at any given time, what this breaks down to with the shifts uh, vacations, sick time, court appearances, you basically have a, uh, pretty much an average, almost a maximum of two police officers on duty at any given time. Now, sometimes that does fluctuate a little bit uh, because we do have a community resource out there working his schedule uh, during the week, the weekdays, as well as the community service officer. And we try to spread them out and put as much manpower as we can in the highest peak times that we uh, see our calls. Uh, currently, we're applying for grants to reinstate uh, the D.A.R.E. program in the North Bend schools, as well as uh, a lot of improvements as far as security uh, with the schools. Uh, that's through the COPS program. And we are also uh, have applied for a grant for an additional police officer position. And we should find out about those two grants here in the upcoming weeks. Usually, usually happens around October. We get notification of whether or not we're successful for those grants. Uh, I don't want to jinx anything, but uh, we've been very active and, and actually been very uh, uh, effective in, in obtaining grants. One of the things that, uh, for those of you who haven't been on the city council before, uh, you hear about staff applying for grants and that goes throughout the departments and, and we are in no way an exception to that. We are constantly doing that and reporting on grants that we currently have that are funding different things. Uh, we, Currently have a patrol fleet of new Dodge Durangos. Uh, this is one of the pride and joys of the police department. Uh, for the first time, uh, I'm a 30 year veteran, retired from Coos Bay, came here in 21. This is the first time I've ever seen North Bend's uh, police fleet like this. It was an objective um, for the city council a goal. And uh, we are now at the point where we just recently this year took the delivery of the, the final uh, Dodge Durangos. And now we have these 10 patrol vehicles, as well as uh, administrative vehicles and, and investigations. <clears throat> what that does done is it's driven our costs for uh, maintenance way down. And, uh, and it's, it's definitely something to be very proud of. And uh, it also, with these vehicles, we can currently in some of the, uh, I'm sure you've seen some of the social media posts and press, we have new license plate readers or LPRs or ALPRs uh, in our vehicles. Uh, and that is something that is unique uh, 
particularly in this area of the state, although there are other agencies and some of them were a little bit irritated about a post recently about us being the first to have all of our patrol vehicles. So I'm not going to say that we're the first, but I can tell you I'm not aware of any agencies that I've worked closely with in this area and most of the state that can say that, but we can. And so we are working out uh, some technical issues with those and getting them up to where they're maximum uh, effective. And uh, that'll be happening here within the next couple of weeks. And we also have the new speed trailers as well. And the one thing I can tell you is that we, uh, we definitely have the best equipment of any of the police departments in our area. Uh, it's, it shows uh, we've been getting some very good applicants to include hiring uh certified police officers which is unique uh and it shows the health of your police department i believe so with that that's uh, the police department thanks chief all right the next will be our fire chief so good afternoon so you have a nice little prepared thing in front of you this morning i woke up about five o'clock in the morning, so that's just not the fire department type thing. So I was also told one sheet of paper in five minutes, so we might have, there we go. So what I have for you guys today, Mr. Waddington, we're, we're changing up from what you guys have in front of Swiss Army knife. Anything that's going on, the fire department's going to take care of. So I've just seen a few highlights on here. So if we look, we respond to emergencies, obviously. About 2,400 of them came. Some are fire, some are medical, and some are others. Others, what does that mean? Well, we have water rescue, we have rope rescue, recently we've had dog rescue, and we also have search and rescue. So we keep very busy, we do a lot of different things. The other part, is the part that we're talking about the Swiss Army knife. If anyone needs anything, if there's ducks in the street that are about to get ran over, the fire department's gonna come out and take care of those ducks. Any, anything that comes up that's out of the normal, that's what your fire department does. That's why we're the Swiss Army knife. We do a lot of public engagements as well. As you guys know, we do our pancake feed every year, and it's coming up yeah, pretty soon. It's, it's a ways out, but it's on Palm Sunday. We have Miss Flame Week, which is gonna be coming up at Next month, the 18th, area. we put on a lot of fire extinguisher classes. We have an open house. We have a lot of school education. Um, and one thing that's really important as well, we get involved with the high schools. Um, when the kids are leaving to go on a their state tournament team, us and the police department will escort them out of town. Um, the kids have mentioned how big of a deal that is to them to be able to be involved in that. So we really take a lot of pride in that. Uh, we are actually really involved in grants as well. Over the last three years, we've got about $900,000 worth of grants. So that's that's a pretty big deal. We're very, very happy about that. And uh, we have a student program where our students that attend college out here, the fire science program, they live in our fire stations. We get to use them to go on calls. They get to gain a lot of experience. And one nice thing is that we've been able to hire um, a number of them that have actually started out as our residents and then they went to school, got their degrees, and we've been able to hire them. And that's been a great feeder for us. And the people that we have are fantastic, what we've got. Uh, we've used some creative cost saving for um, emergency responses. We have our rapid response vehicles, and we're able to respond those when we're at full capacity, and we're not taking out our big fire engines, which are much more expensive. We're able to go out and provide that, um, particularly during the daytime, even when we're not at full staff at daytime. When we have myself and the assistant chief there, we're able to have the smaller vehicles respond out, and then we can respond out secondarily to the next calls that come up. And I don't know how it works, but it seems like we can go, we can be doing our normal maintenance that we do, and not have a call, and all of a sudden we get three before we even get going. That happened just two days ago. Our vehicle started to leave on a medical call. Before they even got out, there was another call. And by the time that they got going on two of them, there was a third call. So myself and the assistant chief run a lady who crashed on her bike and broke her ribs and was hurt pretty bad. So we just, our fire department, that's another thing, is for the Swiss Army. We made stuff for it. Um, 
We're in charge of emergency management as well. And I truly say that I was looking on this. I started thinking about this about five this morning, so I put this out. I was going to say this is the best fire department in the county. Well, that's obvious. Well, the state. Well, that's obvious too. So I'm just going to leave it at we are the best department. And that's what it is. Well, you mean? I, will, I will challenge anybody else. This is this is the best department that we have. There, there is. And the people that are what make that department. And the people that we have over there are exceptional people. They go the extra mile. They do everything they can right now. We have some people that are hurt. We have some people that are off. And our people are stepping in and taking care of what we have to do. They're going the extra mile. And uh, that's what makes the department. As an example of the uh, Swiss Army Army, we went out on a call a few months ago. It was a very bad call. Um, a high school student lost his life. And we went out on that at 5 o'clock in the morning. And it was a bad situation. But how we do everything, by 10 o'clock that morning, we were escorting a high school team out of town to go to a state event. So that's that's your Swiss Army and I fire department. We, we do it all. And we're very proud to do it. And simply, you're our best. Thanks, Steve. All right, so we'll now uh, hear from our community development manager. Well, I would say that's tough to follow, but I kind of agree with everything he said. So we'll leave it at that. I did provide you a flyer. Should be up there. We tried to put them in order for you, but maybe a little out of sorts. My official title is Community Development Manager, and my name is Stephanie Wilson. I've been with the city for two years, and I wear multiple hats. So it's kind of a collective title that I do. So I'm just going to break them down for you on your flyer. You'll see we're going to start with Main Street. Main Street America has been around for over 40 years. It's a national program. So it works kind of like a, per se, four-tier structure. We have National Main Street, which is, of course, national. Then each state has a state coordinating program. And then in some cases, like ours, the city is the next tier down, and then it would go down to the program. So there's 115 Main Street programs in Oregon, and we are one of them. We are at the affiliate level. And we are currently umbrella under the city, although we are working towards our nonprofit status. So what does that mean? It means that we are getting the support and backbones to have a successful program. Many programs, even though they don't identify as Main Street, they are working on Main Street program, much like our sister city in Coos Bay. They are the Coos Bay Downtown Association, but they are working on Main Street program and practicing the four point approach that Main Street implements. I am the only staff for that program. I work off a of volunteer base with my Main Street board, as well as our committee members. And I have, per se, two supervisors. I have the uh, city administrator as well as my board. And so I have a lot of people to answer to. <laughs> uh, what we work on is our four-point approach. We have four committees, organization, promotion, economic vitality, and design. And collectively, if you work those together, you have a wonderful program. And I'm really proud of what we've accomplished the last two years. I like to say what's good for downtown is good for all of North Bend. It's a condensed area. And National Main Street really um, strives for historic preservation. So the Main Street programs are typically identified in the historic district of the city. And the state is the one who's determined that boundary line. However, our program since day one has found ways collectively to include all of North Bend, and we're really proud of that. So we invite them down. Much like tonight, we have a Talk of the Town event. We have 16 businesses who are participating or who are from all throughout North Bend. So that's a really great inclusive program that we, that we work. Uh, we do operate out of the Visitor Information Center, which is one of the facilities that I manage in my department. We are two staff. I have a part-time employee that works for me. She helps run the front. She also helps with uh, taking calls and relocation requests, as well as visitors just coming into the center. We recently just moved down to our uh, newly acquired building right down here at the old Coffee and Sevens Law Office. And that facility is amazing. We've already seen such a spike in visitors, and we don't even have a sign out there yet. And so it's really wonderful to see that location and that, that vision that the council and city had for so long to move that facility down and, and see the benefits of that already. So we also have under the visitor center, because I uh, oversee anything tourism related, since I do work, uh, my fund is Fund 10, which is TLT. It's the acronym for Transient Lodging Tax. 
these are dollars that are from visitors staying at our hotels, motels, Airbnbs. These are not local tax dollars. I think that's the big confusion with my department and my fund that I operate. Within that, we have the North Bend Ice Skating Rink. So shortly after I was hired in 2022, I found out I would be the supervisor for the ice skating rink. And I thought, well, I am not getting on the ice, but I will do all of the other tasks and duties and logistics that need to go into that. So that is a seasonal operation. It is open from December through February, and we typically hire a, a foreman per se to help run that. And then we work with Recruit Hippo to bring in uh, on their dime youth staff to help train and operate the ice skating rink. So that is what I'm working on right now, gearing up to get that facility transformed over because in the off season, we convert it to an event space. So back in July, the library was able to use that facility. And then the Main Street program is using it tonight for the Talk of the Town event. I also assist with urban renewal. Although I'm not the executive director, the city administrator is the executive director. I do assist with facade grants. So any businesses downtown that may be interested in um, improving their space, we have a facade grant, which is a 50-50 match grant with a cap of 25,000. And then we have a redevelopment grant, which is 20 cents on the dollar. So that's for interior work to be done. We've had a few projects since I started 2022, uh, to name a few, Wildflower Public House, we also had the front of the Dream Again Thrift Emporium, the owner of that building, and um, we had the interior of the North 40. They just put a, a good chunk of their own personal dollars into that space as well using the program. So I will help oversee those grants. I will uh, help facilitate the applications and the reimbursement request. And any other properties that are owned by an Urban Renewal, I'll help be that call to person if we need a maintenance issue, I'll coordinate with our other departments to make sure that those are addressed. And with that, I think I might have beat everybody so far time wise. So <laughs> I will leave you with that if you and we'll do questions later. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll now go over to our parks and facilities manager. I bet I can meet her on time. <laughs> My name is Eric Mixler. I do parks facilities and I also run the pool. Um, there is a handout. I'll be pretty brief. I think it's got most of the stuff in there. And if you have any questions after everything's done. So basically the parks department is one of my three. Um, and by three, I mean, I'm, I'm the guy she calls for repairs and we may not be the Swiss army knife, but if it's done around town, we probably had a hand in it. So the parks department, we clean, mow, maintain trees, bathrooms, repair the damage from homeless or, or everyday use. We maintain the playgrounds. We replace that. We replace all the safety equipment there. Um, and that's done daily. In the summer, we also clean bathrooms, restock through the weekends just because of the use is, is so great. Um, those would include Ferry Road, Pim Loop, Simpson, the Harbor, which the docks are there. We do that bathroom as well. Um, Oak Street, buoyant. So those parks are all maintained by us. I have a staff of three in the parks department, uh, one of which has been out uh, for quite some time and have temporary help filling that in. Um, on top of the parks department, there are also our facilities. So all of the buildings here in town, um, we do all the, the maintenance. So the reason the lights and the AC and everything are on, we we try to keep that going. Um, recently had some issues here at City Hall. A lot of our infrastructure is getting old and requires a lot more maintenance. Um, so that's always a challenge. So parks, facilities, and then the pool. Um, with the pool, uh, the facility was built in the 50s. It is old. It does operate off of a tax levy. Um, we're doing our best to bring back in a lot of contracts. This year we're working with the local swim team SCAT. We're also working with North Bend High School, the community college, and I'm trying to bring the Coast Guard back. Uh, with that, we have the Special Olympics in now uh, with a swim contract. And we're working on trying to bring back, I guess, a program that used to be here where they brought school kids over during the day and did some swim lessons. So we're trying to really re-engage the community. There was a period of time when the pool was closed. A lot of that support and community engagement had went away. 
Um, I recently hired a new lady to work at the pool. She's very involved in the community, has a lot of knowledge from the swim. Uh, parts of the, she's worked at Mingus, she worked at North Bend before, she's been in the aquatics field for the last 25 years. So she knows pretty much everyone and has been a great gift to the pool. Um, we're trying to maintain the chemical loads and really get an idea on what that's costing us because two years out we're looking at you know how are we going to maintain this if we don't have the tax levy uh, so with that i think that's pretty much all uh, like i said you can go through the packet there's a lot of stuff listed there that we do um we're not the guys that are out front but if you see the pretty flower baskets and things like that those are us thank you all right thank you and stephanie beat you by 12 seconds uh, we'll now go to Public Works, our Public Works Director. I provided you with a handout. We are the second largest department in the city, 16 full-time employees, of which one position is vacant at this point. Uh, but we're, we manage the infrastructure of the city, and we are really proud that we get about 30 emergency calls a year. Don't keep up with their call volume, but we'd like to get that down to zero, but we're, we've got about 30 emergency calls a year. Um, the Public Works Department basically is a support department, manages $170 million worth of current assets in the city uh, between wastewater, storm water, and streets. Um, we have five major divisions, uh, planning and administration, which is kind of the record keeping department. We actually do in-house design. We're proud of our four staff trying to hire a fifth. Uh, we compare that to Coos Bay's 17. They're 70% larger than we are though, but um, so currently we have four staff doing what approximately the same duties, what they do in Coos Bay with 17. Um, our street department is four personnel, which is combined with the stormwater department. Um, they manage 64 miles of streets and 28 miles of storm sewer. Um, and our wastewater department, which is seven people, manages 51 miles of sewer, 10 miles of our 10 pump stations, and a wastewater treatment plant. And we are almost totally funded, <clears throat> as part of the reason I included that. Um, almost totally funded on separate special revenue funds. Um, we also manage a couple other funds, which are very minor. Our uh, traffic signals, our footpaths and bike trails. And if the fire department is a Swiss army knife, we're the whole tool kit, because yeah, we gotta clean up, we gotta clean up afterwards. I, it's not picking on them on that. They get in there, get her done. We clean up the mess afterwards. <laughs> so, um, and that's basically it. You'll probably have some questions, but. Thanks, Ralph. It's good knowing you. Um, we'll now go to the library, our director of library services. This is the handout for the library. I'm Haley Lagacy, and I am the director at the North Bend Public Library. Your public library is established by a city ordinance, and that ordinance provides guidelines for the operation of our library, as well as establishes a seven-member citizen advisory board. That uh, library board is an advisory board to the city council. We are funded primarily through the Coos County Library Service District, which is a countywide permanent taxing district, which was established in 1992. Annually, the county contracts with the city of North Bend to administer library services. Because of our membership in that library service district, our services at the North Bend Public Library are available to all residents in Coos County. Our library provides service six days a week and we have a wide variety of programs and services and materials that appeal to all different ages and interests. I think that um, our usage statistics, which I've included here from our last fiscal year, illustrate how busy the public library is, what a busy and active place it is. On a typical day, we have between 250 and 300 visitors to our facility. 
Right now, our biggest project is the restoration and renovation of the facility, which is just located behind you on Sherman Avenue. Uh, the facility opened in April of 1989, and we are currently undergoing a major restoration. Um, last year, the exterior of the building was cleaned, repaired, and waterproofed. We are currently under construction for a new roof. And in the end of September, we will begin the first major renovation and, and improvements to the public spaces of the building. The library did get an addition in staff space in 2001, but what we'll be undertaking in the public parts of the building, our reading room, our children's space, our teen area, our meeting rooms, and very importantly, our public restrooms uh, will be the first update since that facility opened. And so that's very important. Uh, we are fortunate to have the support of the city of North Bend uh, in that project. Uh, a large number of local donations and our North Bend Public Library Foundation has raised over $500,000 in grants to support that project. And we love it when you come to visit us. Thank you. All right, so you've had an opportunity to um, hear from me to the department heads and to um, just sort of reiterate, um, since we have everything from Swiss Army knife to toolboxes out here. Um, so think of the city as a corporation, as a rural entity. And so as a corporation, uh, it has a board. The city council is the board of the corporation, if you will. The corporation uh, has a board. The board hires a CEO. That would be your city administrator. The city administrator then implements everything from the board through the departments and divisions. This is the maestro's that make it happen every day. Um, no single person accomplishes everything. It is about teamwork. And so it takes the council and the staff working together as synergy. Um, I've mentioned uh, as you're out on your campaign trail, understand and know this, I am an employee of the board. And so um, when staff issues come up, um, they're dealt by the city administrator, the council is not pervy uh, to personnel action. And same thing as an employee, the board, if there are employee uh, issues, uh, deal with them in executive sessions. So there's no disbargement of staff. Everything's always kept confidential and it's kumbaya. And that's just how um, the cities work for, for liability reasons. And so kudos to them. Um, at the end, um, we'll do a photo of, of, of the six, um, just to um, hopefully uh, share with uh, other cities what we're doing and why. But this is now your opportunity, and we may go over just a little, that's up to you. But this is your opportunity to ask questions. We're gonna do it round robin. And so we'll just start at the right and go left. And if you don't have a question, that's great, but you get one question. And then if we go through, then we'll circle back and we'll continue to answer your questions. Um, and this is your opportunity since you'll be out on the campaign trail. And then as you are out on the campaign trail, um, I will, um, before you leave, if you don't already have it, I'll give you my card. If you have questions or you hear something or uh, you want to know something more, reach out. I am here as a resource. No different than the public would contact me. Know this, however, because you are a candidate, any information that I provide you will go back to all of the candidates. Um, it's a level playing field. We do not, you know, we're not in this. There is a policy against us getting involved in the campaign. There's no campaigning here at City Hall in the chambers. There's no campaigning among staff. And so we cannot take a position and it's a nonpartisan position for you all anyway. And so with that said, um, uh, Tim, you've got the first question. If you've got one, if not, we'll go on to uh, Susanna. I guess mine comes uh, sort of focusing on the Main Street uh, program, which I think has done a lot of very positive things and is probably one of the most energetic that you can find on the, uh, certainly in the coastal Oregon. But I was wondering how, um, how have we been able or how do we focus on generating or stimulating small business that's outside of the specified area for Main Street? 
Sure. So uh, we do, like I mentioned earlier, the state determines our boundaries. They focus on the historic district within the city, uh, the condensed area. We find ways to collaboratively share out um, the other businesses. So let me give you a couple of examples. Tonight is our talk of the town and all of the departments have um, operated talk of the town over the last couple of years. We use ours as an opportunity to bring in the outside businesses. We open it, we, we do a press release, we advertise on the social media to come in, set up, we'll help. So we listed our, our end too to help promote them. Um, we do cross promoting as well uh, for Sip and Stroll. We always have about three businesses who want to participate downtown, but open their doors to other businesses that aren't in the area to come down. So they get that exposure. We usually have between three and 400 people attending those events. And um, Candy Crawl coming up, we do a truck or treat. So even though our downtown businesses are doing handing out candy, store to store, the trunk or treat offers opportunity for other outside businesses to come down and get the exposure as well. Is that the best, is that answer? Well, that helps. Okay. Yes. All right. High level. So Stephanie is um, focused on uh, Main Street, which is governed by the state. Sure. It's a contract. Uh, she works with me on then the Urban Renewal Agency and so that is then the district outside of the district then i'm the also the city's economic developer mm -hmm. and so i work with stephanie and also our city planner and public works on anything outside the area um, so we have our enterprise zones mm -hmm. our opportunity zones um, uh, for instance we collaborated with energy trust on all of the led lighting upgrade which was available to anybody in the city so there's all of those programs that we're working on. You see that heavy emphasis because that's a state run program that the council authorized by contract. And anyone that understands Main Street understands that it is the, um, it was described by the state director. That is uh, sort of the heart of the city. And if the heart mm -hmm. dies, the rest of your city dies. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't have a problem with that. No, no, I'm just trying to explain it out a little bit more. We do also offer yes. uh, sponsorship and um, fundraiser opportunities too so we within the main street program and as well as the ice gaming program we offer sponsorships for those um cities or the uh businesses within the city can also get exposure that way yeah. uh, very much like the the mall saturday is an initiative that we work with the council revised our ordinances through public works and planning and so that's how they have their saturday market Yep. With that said, Ms. Susanna, you uh, have a question? If I not, I have a question, and I certainly don't mean to um, be accusing or anything, but it was my understanding that the council had two contracts, one for the city administrator and one for the city attorney. And had that changed at some point? I thought that the council authorized a separate contract so that both were individual separate contracts authorized specifically. And that the city attorney was not, so to speak, reporting to the city administrator. So that's that's what I believe I heard. Had that been the way when you were on the council? Then so again, you so always. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying. I to get clarify. that. You always like to refer back. So refer to your charter. You have a copy in your book that you're given through orientation. Um, the uh, uh, we do an RFP process right. and the council selects the contract then is executed by the city administrator as CEO okay. and the day to day operation. So, you know, that no individual council member, unless authorized can contact the city attorney. It represents the royal city and the charter sets out that the city attorney attends the meetings, um, does not represent any individual council member. Um, and um, is uh, operates as a quasi staff member of legal. Um, a lot of cities bring in uh, legal services internally and they operate as a department within. Coos Bay does that. Um, but the legal services is legal representation. So for instance, that's why the city administrator is copied in on all uh, correspondence with the council as a CEO. Okay. Yeah, that kind of clarifies it. I, I noted that the legal Oregon City's model rules does state that <clears throat> city councilors may contact the city attorney as long as it's not over two hours. All right, so counselor, 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 second. if I may, so ours again, is more a counselor, if I may, we're going to hold the questions because this happens all the time. Um, the model rules she's referring to is just that 
The council dictates its rules, its policies, and it can change them as they want, and they have. It has nothing to do with staff. Um, Harry, um, do you have a question for staff? I do. Uh, it's for the chief of police. Chief, uh, will you come forward? Oh. And this is not something that you had brought up, but uh, something I've been curious about for a while is uh, since we've moved the uh, uh, dispatch to Coos Bay, yes. um, how is that working? Is that, uh, I mean, is it working well or is it, is it something we need to look into or, uh, I just didn't know how that would work, beings that are taking care of all of that for us. It's a good question. Uh, the, and it's kind of an ever-changing question right now. Uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, within that uh, dispatch center, but uh, it, I think that uh, it's been working extremely well. Uh, it uh, has allowed the city uh, to save a significant amount of money, uh, and it is uh, it was just an incredible opportunity, and it's worked out very well. Uh, right now, that same dispatch center has taken over the other 911 center previously operated by the Coos County Sheriff's Office, and now they're both combined in there. That is ultimately what every law enforcement person uh, in the county in my entire career has hoped would happen at one day, that those two centers would combine. And uh, right now, they're, they're down positions there, so they're understaffed, but they're doing a very good job. So yes. Thank you. And, and they've taken on the county, right? What's that? And they've taken on the county for dispatching. Yes, that's that's what I was referring to. That that other center was the central for everybody. You know? So yes, a, all police departments, all fire departments, all rural fire departments, everything is being dispatched through that center. So again, being fair, one question. So uh, thank you. And by the way, over the time, I think it was five years, was estimated about eight hundred thousand dollars savings. And so, uh, and we have realized those savings. Um, it, it would take six full-time employees in the police department to have dispatch um, 24 seven. And we uh, were woefully generally at four, sometimes three dispatchers. And um, we were failing miserably. Um, Mr. Hamilton, do you have a question? Uh, one quick one. Uh, I haven't heard anything, but how is the pool with the new pumps and everything working out? You want to come on up. So prior to my arrival, I got here in uh, January of this year, so the newest member of the team. But prior to my arrival, all the, the equipment in the back of the pool, all the, the heart of the facility, the sand filters and all were replaced. Um, we've got most of that lined out. There's still a couple issues because that all had to be custom fit to a 1950s building. Um, so you kind of put a 2020 motor in a 1950 car and we've had some challenges. Uh, most of that has been lined out. We're getting a pretty steady, even chemical reading and, and function. I'm still waiting on a few little items. Um, the UV light, we're still waiting on some parts to come from overseas. Um, but all of that is functioning fairly well and given us a pretty steady read on what we're going to need to operate each year. Do you have any questions? All right, fire department, Swiss Army knife. Uh, well, actually, you, you, you'll, you'll get part of the uh, knife. Uh, yes, part of it. <laughs> the one right below. Yeah. The Swiss part had to go. I was just curious um, about your student program, like how many average that you have each year, and what's their success rate to getting a job like right after going through that program? It's really, really good. So it, go, it fluctuates, right? So it goes from we can have them for two years to three years. Um, and our goal for our student program is to train them and give them the skills to get career jobs, hopefully at our department, which, by the way, right now we have uh, six on, on staff that were residents at North Bend that are career right now. But then we have um, residents in Alaska, Hawaii, um, Oregon, Washington, all over. Um, and the success rate is really well. We have three right now. We have capable of having uh, five at the main station, and then we could have three to four at our 
uh, Bymar Station or Station 2, um, but they have to have certain skill level to go over there, um, which is a very beneficial for them and for us because then they're responding out the engines and stuff from that station. So we have a whole program for that, but very successful rate for that. Yeah. All right. Madam Mayor, question? Um, all right. Uh, so my question is for the police department. All right, Chief. And. Unless you want to bring up the captain, put him on the spot. I know he's just been hanging you know, back you know, there. <laughs> Brian got an opportunity, just saying. Um, so um, the, I know the council had adopted the ordinance for time, place, and manner um, yes. where people could camp. And my question is for you today, because I'm sure your job is impacted um, daily, if not weekly, and it probably changes. So as a snapshot, like right now, how is that working for the city of North Bend and for the staff as far as it, um, are you, uh, you know, the city has kind of gone through like the peak of summer now and yes. had some pretty significant rain. So I would imagine things change for you on a daily basis. So how is it helping you? Is it working? Um, how does that apply to um, okay, so we have uh, a camping ordinance, uh, I believe it's eight to seven uh, are the, the hours of the, as far as the time is concerned uh, and the place being the two different zones we have, which is right here in this general area around the, uh, and Union Street, uh, around the uh, city hall. And it, have, you know, we have re provided reports to the council uh, throughout this time uh, since the adoption of the ordinance. Uh, and I think that it's working extremely well. Uh, and I, you know, I, we're, we're a small city, but I think we're providing a very good example for the rest of the state on how you can take action and, and put something in place like this that not only serves uh, the city, but in particular helps the homeless population itself. Um, we do experience, uh, as Mayor Ingleclee was, uh, <clears throat> uh, basically outlining is the we do see a peak number of people that come into our area during the summertime um, one of the things that makes our area attractive uh, to people in the situation is that for one we have a very moderate mild climate uh, and anywhere on the coast you're going to run into that we're also located next door to another city who has the majority of the services available to the homeless population uh, and so that's those are the influencing some of the influencing factors there, but uh, I would say. Um, like probably last night this morning, I was through there yesterday as well, I, you will probably start to see a decline in the number of overall people that are using utilizing these areas uh, for camping. That answer your question. Yeah, okay. You. All right, and um, for the benefit of the others. There certainly was a uh, ruling by the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, it gave no relief to the state of Oregon. We have to wait to the legislature to uh, meet. Um, it's on a huge priority list of the late legislature. Um, and that is because our governor, while she was in the legislature, worked through uh, and got a bill and took what was a ban and made it state law. And so when the Supreme Court said, nope you go back we were handcuffed and so you have like washington and california sandwiching us so right now we're a homeless haven i will tell you that at the most recent um uh, oregon mayor's association uh, north bend was heavily given kudos um, because a lot of governments in the state modeled our process our ordinance um as sort of best of class and so uh, um and so i offer that to you all right, Tim, you get another question, if you have one. Well, you told me not to. No, no, you round robin, you I'm have to. to be good. You, you get one. And, and so I, I love opinions, but save them for the campaign trail. So questions is the opportunity here. But but you got to go round robin. So this well, is your time. Fine. You're I'm up. Play by the rules. I always do that. But uh, um, one question I had, and it could encompass all departments, I'm, I'm looking to engage more of the citizens in an understanding government and maybe serving and being part of it. So I'm interested in volunteer uh, opportunities and programs, you know, within their departments and secondarily in things like uh, police and to a certain degree fire, um, you know, some areas have had uh, um, 
citizen, gosh, I don't know what you call it, workshops, you know, essentially they go through a, uh, maybe a three or four different meeting training on that. And uh, so I was just interested in, in what those things, uh, what we have or what, what volunteer or what you would like to see. Yeah. So Macy, um, how many volunteers do we have collectively? You do the roster. Currently, a library has the most volunteers right now. Haley, do you know the exact number that you have? I would imagine that we have somewhere around 40. Yeah, volunteers. that's what I thought. Library has the most right now. I know that the fire department has uh, volunteer firefighters. However, they do get paid for their service. Um, we get random volunteer applications every once in a while. You can put in to volunteer with any department within the city if you choose to. Um, we'd be able to find areas that could use assistance, that kind of thing, um, wherever it's needed. So any citizen can apply for any department to volunteer in if we mm -hmm. have something for them to do. And how many uh, certificates did you print last time? Oh, 106. All right, so 106 volunteers. Um, the council has the ability to create committees or utilize committees. Um, uh, and so those are outside the purview of staff. That's a that's up to the governing body. Um, however, we also then have our talk of the towns uh, that was referred to. And so that is um, heavy engagement with the public. Um, and those are one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions when uh, we've done those. Um, I will say that the Main Street's um, uh, collaborative effort um, has garnered the most. Um, the police department kicked off um, the whole program almost two years ago um, and almost filled the, um, uh, the Liberty Theater. And so, um, uh, and then we're constantly soliciting uh, volunteers through departments. Um, we don't control the council and we don't control the council committees. That's up to the council and what they refer to them. Yeah. Um, we do have the standing um, planning commission. Um, uh, they are all volunteers. Um, and so um, outside that, um, that sort of, you know, does anybody else have any feedback on, uh, we brought back the uh, reserve program in the police department and we're growing that. That was a defunct program. So that's been pretty active and is growing. In fact, uh, Buddy is uh, a reserve officer, uh, even after retiring after 44 years. And so anybody else have anything else to offer on that question? I'm always looking for volunteers. <laughs> yeah, so, all right. Susanna, next question. Um, I'm wondering if there's if there is um, what the what the preparations are, the thought out. We go to we go to this. If there's a magnitude nine earthquake, is there? Um, do all the departments kind of know what their go to is? And Ralph's smiling, so I I think he probably yeah. is. You want to come up? up uh, I'd, I'd like somebody, whatever department, to come up. Absolutely. Want to well, come on up, uh, Waddington? Yeah. You're. Uh, uh, Swiss Army is gone, but uh, you yeah. can talk about emergency management and all of the training. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, City Recorder Macy, um, how many certifications do you have now of classes? You had the largest stack of certificates. Oh, the ICS yeah. classes. ICS. Yes. How many did you submit? I think there was like mm, 12 or something. Yeah, yeah. there you go. That was a lot. Yeah, so uh, Chief Brown mentioned that the fire station, the EOC, the emergency operations center for the city. So for you to know is that over there we have booklets for every part of the ICS program, incident command system, and for every position in, in the city. So for planning, we have a book for that planning person, whoever that might be, okay. right? Okay. So we have, because not necessarily the department head will be there, it might be the one right below below uh, what, Ralph. What does ICS stand for? Incident Command System. Okay. And so we have that all set up. We have five radio bases where we can put antennas up in our yard. If you haven't seen that before, we can put 30 foot antennas up in our yard and have five different radio stations. So when that earthquake does happen, we still have radio communication where we can talk with the police, we can talk with other agencies around. Um, so we do have operation in place uh, and we are we are going to be training more. We need to be training uh, more, get everybody over. But the ICS 
classes that everybody in the city has from ICS 100, 200, 300, 400, all those 12 different really? ones. There's a ton of ICS training that we have okay. and that we utilize. Okay. We have satellite phones in both the fire department and That's police good. department, That's so good. we can talk. Um, we're putting up right now a antenna system for our ham operators, uh, ham radio operators, where they can use a computer and email, send information out to the world. So once we get this antenna set, system set up, they can communicate with the so East Coast. Who are the ham radio operators? They're local volunteers that come in, and they come in a, a lot. And both at our main station and our station two, we have ham operator radios. They'll come in, they'll work on it, and so they're kind of parts of the CERT team too. So, yep. Yeah. And then uh, as part of that, um, we had, uh, uh, for instance, we had a drill where uh, we had to go out and actually wake up some folks and bring them in. The mayors participated in the drill. We learned that we need to have better coffee um, because when you get there at that crazy hour, but for instance, we alerted on a tsunami alert that we got. And so we activated the entire EOC. Uh, the council has um, worked through and approving the revised um, uh, emergency operations plan. So the council has adopted um, the most current plan and also transferred uh, operational from the police department back to the fire department where it was supposed to be. Um, it also was the rationale for buying the rapid attack vehicle so that we actually had four wheel drive vehicles in the fire department um, to actually respond throughout the city in the event of a disaster. So, um, and then um, I think coming up, we have the tabletop exercise um, at the airport as well for disaster preparedness at the airport. So we also participate in that. And we also then have a counterpart at the county. And so it's collectively, it's not just about North Bend. So, all right, Harry, next question. If you have one, if not, you can pass. I just want to apologize for that. That was my glucose monitor. Oh, don't, don't <laughs> apologize, it's all good. I turned my other phone off, but that one stayed on. Um, no, I, I don't think I have any good questions right now. Well, any question doesn't have to be a good one or otherwise, but <laughs> if you want to <laughs> pass, I tell I folks, did. you know, um, uh, a bad question is the one that you didn't ask. All right, right so, uh, Matt, any questions? No, I'm good. Well, I have one more question. Yes, please. I'm curious. Um, for the chief. All right, Chief, you hey, set up the captain. Make him do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask something about the tsunami thing? Super fast? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, we also have tsunami hazard handouts at the visitor center, and that's one that I frequently hand out, especially to visitors. A lot of them have never even seen the ocean. And so we do on the community engagement aspect of visitors, we are also handing those out. Wow. All right, so um, we're going to test out the uh, captain here, but this way I could get him in a photo. Okay, um, I'm just curious, with your community piece, I mean, resource officer, like, um, how many contacts do they make weekly or daily, and like, how do you track that data? Um, so the first part of that is a lot. He contacts a lot of people. So I would say his morning usually starts out with uh, contacting everybody in all the camping areas. Um, so he's uh, out seeing if he can get them into any type of resources, if they're willing to take that or not. And so the exact number on that um, is, is, it's, it's, uh, Probably on average, just from what I'm hearing on the radio, I would say that he's probably contacting somewhere around like 15 to 20 people a day and working with them, trying to get them resources. So I will tell you as a city administrator, um, so um, I, I take a lot of the um, inquiries from the council and then I work through staff to follow up through them. And so um, uh, the council is like the eyes and ears out there. I, we can't be everywhere, nor are we. And so the council is really eyes and ears. And um, so uh, for instance, every now and then, especially through the summer, um, activity on the boardwalk was heavy. Um, the mayor will know, I sent her a photo this morning and said, yep, here we are out in the pouring down rain and, and um, uh, CSO and, and the new trainee on coming on board, um, they're on their way. And uh, sure enough, you know, they're cleaning up because sometimes they take advantage of it, but they know them on first name basis. They know uh, who they are. Uh, they know about them. They're coordinating every service that they need is available to them, um, except for mental health. We don't have a sober service. 
And so those are things that we can't provide them, but they work with them. Um, it's amazing. You can do ride alongs if why throughout your campaign, if you want to do a ride along, uh, contact either the chief or captain, fill out a form, um, uh, go out there. No, you're not allowed to carry a gun. Um, uh, I know a council member that, you know, would like to, but you can't carry a gun. Uh, you, you don't get involved. You know, my wife has done it. You stay there at the vehicle. You're not like taking anyone down. Um, it's there to go out and observe and see what they're experiencing firsthand. Um, and uh, you'll be surprised um, uh, what, what they have to deal with. Um, and so um, we, we commend uh, the officers. They get immense amount of training and go through a lot. But um, this is, I was talking to uh, one of our uh, sergeants and, and unfortunately it's gone from law enforcement to where there are more social workers um, than they are law enforcement. And, and that's unfortunate, um, but everything the chief has mentioned, the license plate readers, the speed detection, all of those are designed to reduce our property crimes um, and keep a criminal element out of our city. Um, the license plate readers, you know, if your tags expired, if you're wanted, you know, uh, you got an Amber Alert on, don't come to North Bend because we're going to know it. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to protect our citizens from a criminal element. In fact, there's one gentleman I've noticed, I was talking to someone today, it's like, man, I haven't seen him in our, oh, that's right. He doesn't have valid tags. No wonder I haven't seen him in our city for a while. So anyway, does that answer your question? All right, All right Madam Mayor, you're up next. So I have a question that was in the um, finance director's packet, but it's probably more of a, it might be more of a public works answer. All right, so you both can come up. It's a twofer. Right. Come on, um, twofer. And it was just, it was because of the way that it was worded on, on the handout here. It says um, $60 million in backlog of sewer related deferred maintenance and then we need two million more a year for repairs so just for clarity um the way i'm reading this is the current amount of money that has been funded for repairs is short two million for what you anticipate of the unknown knowns and then the 60 million would be the so those, so the two million is the known unknowns. Like you have a bucket of money, like we're going to have to repair. But the deferred, the sixty million of backlog sewer-related deferred maintenance is things that might not work today, but is the unknown of when that's going to happen. Is that is that the I, best way to? I, I think that? I'm See? probably the best one to answer that. Jeff and I had this conversation prior to here, this, so we're depreciating at about. Uh, $2 million a year, roughly, in our assets in the wastewater department. Again, critical, basically, year in life of collection system. Mechanical equipment's different. I went through this explanation before, like how long are you going to drive a car? Probably not 70 years and use it as a primary source. Mechanical equipment goes away quicker, 25 years, 30 years. Um, but some of our fixed asset, you may live in a building for a hundred years. It's probably going to take some remodel. So we have been replacing on our system. And when it gets to that critical age, you've got to be replacing it, but it accumulates depreciation up to that point, even though, um, so on a 70 year rotation, which is a useful life, the design life's about 50. On a 70 year rotation on our collection system alone, um, we should be replacing about 3,800 feet of main line a year. That's about $1.8 million of replacement cost right now today. Um, but we've only been replacing about 1,100 feet a year, not 3,800 feet a year, 11 to 1,300 a year on the average for the last 30 years. So there's a backlog there it's not critical as far as a sewer rate increase that's going out to a ballot measure today we're at 58 year average on our system and like i said 70 is the critical life more or less i mean doesn't mean it won't last longer but that's uh, 50 years design life 70 years expected life um so we have a backlog and as far as the sewer rates go, we're trying to maintain approximately that 
55 to 60 year old um, age where we don't have a lot of problems. You start getting much older, you have them, you know, catastrophic failures uh, and that type of thing. So there's still a backlog, which you want to, if you want to call it deferred maintenance, it doesn't mean that the maintenance uh, had, that you just ignored it and should have fixed it. But we're at that age where if you were using annual depreciation, we're about $60 million behind. Um, but if we maintain it where we're at, the system should be sufficient um, without catastrophic issues. And we need, like I said, need, we need to have been doing about 1.8 million a year based on our depreciation. We're at that point now, we don't want it to get any older. So, <clears throat> um, as part of the impetus for our sewer rates is we need to be replacing today 1.8 million and we still have a backlog so if for some reason we get caught up a little bit we may but we won't see it we won't get caught up for 20 years i can tell you that um so miss macy i apologize so uh thank you gentlemen um, uh, you know I, I realized that you were like under like me administration and Come on up, introduce yourself and let folks know all the different hats that you wear and the vital services that you provide the city of North Bend. Hello everyone, my name is Macy Janig. I am the city recorder for the city of North Bend. I'm also the human resources manager um, as well as the elections official. So I am responsible for maintaining all the city's records with the exception of police reports and fire records. Um, I do all the human resource services for the entire city, so I, I support all the employees as best I can. Um, and elections official this time of year, every two years for our elections, um, I am who you will all come to, who I've all met before, uh, and we do the whole entire elections process together. So I do a little, a little bit here and there, and I do what I can for everybody, so. She's a dynamo and she's one person. Yeah. With a lot of hats and a lot of legal pressures because mm -hmm. she has to deal with all of the labor law, human resources, public records law, election yep. law, um, all of the um, open meetings, open records, and destruction. She destroys yep. a lot of things in the city called records <laughs> uh, based on a schedule. So, uh, so, so my apologies. It's okay. She was she was a dispatcher before that. Yes. So she's she's got. Very good nerves. Yep, you can I, handle stress. I yep. started with the city in 2019 as a 911 dispatcher for the North Bend Police Department, and then after they transferred dispatch services to Coos Bay, I moved upstairs. So, so I'm during, familiar with a lot of the employees. So during that whole tenure of being a dispatcher, how mm -hmm. time? How many times did you meet the former uh, police chief? He uh, hired me, <laughs> and I probably a few times. He didn't come see us very often. I was night shift strictly. So I was there from you know from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, so we didn't get a lot of visitors at night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, uh, they, they were uh, they were sinking down there. Yeah. All right. So Tim, um, do you have any other questions? You're up next. Do you have any other questions? Do you? Let me see. Oh, I was uh, interested in the economic development uh, various projects and things we have going on, and of course, uh, generally in the urban renewal area. Uh, the end all and be all is okay. When does the annex come down, and what uh, you know? What, where are we headed? On that? The annex is an easy one. I can take that. Um, we received four million dollars um, paperwork for um, a uh, submission that we did two years ago um, uh, because of the shutdown in the federal government. There was a huge delay of getting things approved um, at the federal level. Um, and uh, they have just last week gotten us the packet to start the contract. Um, to give you an example, in 2021, we got the FEMA grant, EPA, EPA grant, and like, um, are, are we starting to put that on the street now or soon? We, we have two projects bid and We'll be starting construction probably in the next week, but yeah. uh, we still don't have our grant 
uh, we have a grant. We've got the application at the end of the month that's supposed to be signed. Yeah, and that was the 2021 cycle. So our goal is if everything does work, we're going to tear down the annex next year um, and build the housing there. And so, um, uh, but again, we're at the mercy of the federal government uh, in the process um, and have to follow their T's and I's. And so that's a $4 million uh, carrot that they've given us. We are unique. We're the only project in the entire country ever approved through the CIP that actually is workforce housing. Um, normally they tie it to, uh, and most folks are like saying, well, low income housing or affordable housing, they all mean different things. Uh, I'm sure you understand a little bit about the, uh, the definitions. Workforce housing means that we're allowed to restrict it to um, healthcare workers, public safety, uh, educators, and logistic workers. Logistics tied to uh, the container ship project um, that will eventually come to Coos Bay. And so the goal, as I keep telling folks, is we're optimistic for 2025, but I give you no guarantees um, because we are having um, some issues getting through SHPO, um, State Historic Preservation Office, um, because we actually have to do a historic preservation clearance and um, uh, they, um, it's been, um, it's like climbing a, a hundred foot ladder with a six foot ladder, uh, trying to get them to get us uh, the working agreement um, and solidify it so that we can even start the process. And we've been working on that, say for eight months. So um, we, we continue to keep chipping away. Um, at that or other economic development projects. So, good, good answer. That, all right, next question. Um, okay, the um, local government investment pool, I guess this is a question for Mr. Bridges. Quite <clears throat> so, is that where our reserve funds are? Are they mostly all invested in that, or are some in just like CDs that just kind of sit there until you take all the funds out? Now, all of the excess funds of the city are invested in the state's uh, local investment in investment, local government investment pool, or LGIP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the city has no Save. CDs. We, oh, I was just going to say, we, we sweep money in and out to a bank account that we use for our operating, um, and then we have one more for payroll, but that's really it. Everything that comes to us is... If it's in excess of a certain amount, we sweep it yeah. over to the state for, for investment and purposes. Currently paying what percentage? Who well, last time I checked it was it was a good return of about five and a quarter percent. This is this is a fund um, that's available to all jurisdictions and special districts. And I I tried for four months to get the fire district to invest the eighty thousand dollars that they had in a checking account. And I finally pulled over the finance okay, director. Counselor, of counselor, I want. I appreciate that. Yeah. But as they say, save that for war stories. Yep. Um, Thank you. There, there was so much that came in from the investment pool. We were able to pay off our fire truck and save taxpayers um, over three hundred thousand dollars because of that. Any more questions, Harry? I do. I have a follow-up question on the sewer. All right. Come on up, Ralph. It's not a. It's not long. Run. Um, so, with what we're replacing the old sewer lines with that you're working on now, uh -huh. um, what are we replacing them with, and how long will that is that expected to last before it need to be replaced again? There are we're our biggest problem. We actually our oldest sewer is primarily um, vitreous clay clay pipe. That is chemically inert. Other than it leaks like a sieve, the joints don't hold up. I mean, the, a sewer pipe is a, a bell, a joint, and a, a section of pipe. Uh, they didn't use rubber gaskets back then, but the rubber gaskets would be gone by today anyway. Um, that is inert um, to chemical attack pretty much. So our oldest pipe, which was put in around 1911, up into the 1930s, primarily uh, was clay pipe. And it actually, functionally, other than it leaks like a sieve, which 
has capacity issues at our plant is in relatively good condition. The pipe that we're replacing today, we started in 1948, primarily is when the, gov the government did their, the feds did their initial, let's sewer America. Um, you were able to, they both put regulations in place and provided money. We, our first treatment plant was built in 1952 or completed. We started in 1948. That's primarily concrete pipe and it is not concrete pipe. Sewer produces uh, hydrogen sulfide which produces sulfuric acid, which corrodes and eats up concrete pipe. So almost all the pipe that was put in from 1948, I'm not going to say all of it because there was some asbestos cement, which you can't put in anymore, um, a little bit of cast iron, ductile iron, um, but up until the early 80s was concrete pipe. Um, and that pipe is primarily what our problem issue is because in about 70 years is corroded away. Now we're replacing it primarily with PVC. Um, there are some of those systems, they had some really good piping back in the days um, that were specialty, but were very expensive, so it wasn't very well, very used very often. Um, Amaron, some other stuff, but the life expectancy of PVC is still about 70 years, um, probably not because of the chemical problems, but um, the, the material itself is expected to start relaxing over time. Um, so you could have potential collapses in pipe. I, the, the book's still out. They started putting PVC in. PVC started in the 70s, maybe earlier than that. Common use was mid 80s here, everything we're putting in almost, unless it's very shallow, um, which you may be using ductile iron just because of the strength, um, or a specialty pipe for some reason, um, HDPE, which is still a plastic, um, almost everything's 3034 PVC, which is kind of the flagship today. Again, expected life, hopefully, it's expected life's about 70 years. Concrete's expected life was 50, so maybe it'll last 90. I Again, it hasn't been out there long enough for us to say, oh yeah, it's gonna last 100. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Hamilton, any questions? Or? Yeah, Ralph. Uh oh, Ralph, you're right. Why don't we, uh, what's the, uh, our conditions of our streets and our repair program for that? Mm -hmm. You want to know what the condition, <laughs> our, our roadway condition overall is, I'm going to say fair, um, as an overall standard. Our issue is again, street paving started as, as far as asphalt, our concrete streets, again here I was picking on concrete. You have Simpson Heights built in 1923, now other than it's a little rough the surface is still there. I mean, uh, Monroe, part of Union Avenue, um, it's more expensive to repair, but it's definitely a more durable product. I mean, uh, like, yeah, like our, our money funds for repairing. Uh, money, uh, I'll go, I'm not, most of our streets were paved in 1950, mid-1950s through 1975. That's there was both, uh, when all our local improvement districts, a lot of development in the town, so subdivisions pay for your streets being built when they do the subdivision. Um, they didn't do that in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, and 40s, up until the 50s when the city said you have to pave your streets. Most of them were done in local improvement districts. In other words, the adjoining homeowners paid for them. There was actually some federal funds available, primarily for major streets, arterials and collectors, Virginia, Broadway, Sherman, uh, in the 60s. So most of those streets were paved 60 years ago, the average. Residential street will last an asphalt street without significant maintenance 30 to 35 years. Um, a collector or arterial which gets significant traffic about 20 to 25 years. Our current funding is it's about a million and a quarter a mile to replace streets right now. As I said, we have, as far as improved streets, we have 57 miles 
plus seven miles of gravel road. Um, and we're not even counting the maintenance on those right now. But so, and we have about 400,000 to replace those. That replaces about a quarter mile. Take 57, divide it by a quarter, and, and that tells you what you could expect your street to be replaced in. Um, in the, next 200, in the next 200 years. Um, but we focus our monies because we have very, very limited funds. That's the reason one of Public Works suggested council goals was a street fee, um, which Coos Bay has, or a gas tax, something, because we're funded through gas tax. The federal government hasn't raised their gas tax since 1987, 1991, somewhere in that era. It's been, federal gas tax has been 18 and a half cents a gallon since I'm just going to say 1990, 18 cents, you know, that money in 1990 gets you a whole lot farther than it does today. Um, the state actually has raised their gas tax. Um, five years ago, they did a graduated scale. Um, and that's what funds our street replacement. They did a graduated scale. I think we went up from 27 to 34 cents, I think is what the state gas tax is today over four years, um, but gas tax is what funds our street replacement. The Our funds are dwindling and our costs are going up um, as it sits today. So there's we need another vehicle in order to maintain our streets. A lot of our streets, if you're familiar at all with street maintenance you know everybody will say tell you alligator street is a bad base that's you need to replace the base because that those streets uh that tells you the base has failed that's always been kind of go through engineering school that's a sign of a bad base well the truth of the matter with our streets is the structure of a roadway you have a certain amount of base rock that provides so much support. You have a certain amount of asphalt, which provides so much support. Well, you get to 50, 60 year old asphalt that may have been laid at two inches, which is a little too thin anyway, but we won't even go there. That's now functionally because the oils have disappeared out of it. The gravel goes away. We're working with, in a lot of cases, an inch asphalt. Base is in fine shape in most of the streets we replace. Um, it's just the asphalt so thin now, it's just breaking it up and looking alligator. I mean, when you start seeing sunken spots and that type of thing, that's a that's a base failure. But when the whole street's alligator, but it's pretty, that's just because the asphalt's so old, it doesn't provide that support anymore. It's all broken up. And that's where we're at today. I mean, your residential streets, we're focusing our money primarily on streets that get over a thousand vehicles per day traffic. Your average residential street gets two to 400 cars a day or some of them even a lot less than that 60 um, so that's going to quickly talk about um, uh, our local gas tax and then also um, Coos Bay's um, fee on their water bill so Coos Bay has a street fee we have tried in 2017 I believe both cities went together where it was all or nothing both cities had to vote it in for a five cents a gallon gas tax? Four. Four? It was, four. it was prior to my time, so I remember voting on it, but it didn't put it together, uh, which failed. So Coos Bay implemented a, three years ago, a $10 a month street fee, which is billed on your water bill, similar to our public safety fee or our stormwater fee. Um, for Coos Bay, that generates a little over a million dollars a year. Um, obviously, we're a smaller city. We wouldn't generate quite that much, but I think they're close to a million four. So we might generate eight or 900,000, which would be significant. I mean, we can replace about a quarter of a mile a year with our current capital outlay monies. We have a million dollars, a little over a million dollars in revenue a year. We spend about 400,000 of it on actual street replacement, but we spent about 380 on personal services and 320 on uh, um, on materials, but if you're not fixing them, we still need materials to fix them. You also have to realize 
we trim trees, we cut the brush, we do striping, we maintain signs. It's not just a street replacement. There's a lot of other materials and services that the street department maintains. Um, and equipment, our street sweeper, we can order a new street sweeper this year, $500,000 for a new street sweeper, and they last about 12 years. So um, anyway, capital improvements, a street fee or a gas tax. Gas taxes are dwindling. We're going to vehicles that now get 40 miles to a gallon, 30, 40 miles a gallon. Again, like I said, the federal gas tax hasn't changed since 1990 when probably the average miles per gallon on a vehicle was probably 14. I mean, uh, remember, remember back in those days, what you didn't get very good gas mileage. I never got uh, <laughs> You know, uh, Today you got cars, probably a new car today you're buying probably is in the 30 miles per gallon unless you're paying the gas guzzler fee and buying a Hellcat, Dodge Hellcat or something. But uh, uh, so, and then with the hybrids and the EVs, um, those monies are actually going down. And for example, this year, and you know, you deal in construction, concrete went up $25 a cubic yard. Asphalt's gone up about $30 a ton this year, which is about a 25% increase. So our dollars just don't stretch. I, I can go on and on, so I'm gonna stop. That just tells you why um, we get a lot of complaints, but we just don't have the money. Um, and so how much, um, I saw the figure in here, how much do we need roads? Was Is it about 80 million if I do the calculation? Uh, to bring them up to all good condition. Yeah, about 80 million and so um, we've considered a bake sale or two um, EVs of course um, higher mileage um, vehicles um, the state ODOT is also going bankrupt and uh, they have already given out numbers of how high they would have to raise the gas tax in order for their budget and so you're going to hear a lot about that through the next legislature and so that's also affecting us aggressively um, the reality is, is that um, uh, 60, if I'm not mistaken, the number 63% of all cities in the state are fiscally stressed. We're running at, as you saw, just about a million dollar deficit. Um, uh, Coos Bay and the county, everybody else, the cities, they're all doing this. Uh, with the taxation structure in the uh, state, we are all on a trajectory because cost is exceeding the 3% of uh, property. And so you all are feeling it when you see your insurance bills go up, when you see your food, your household expenses, utilities gone up over 50% in, in a course of about a year time. And so we're still stuck at that same 3%. We also are in a situation where homes, um, uh, 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 when they put in uh, two measures in the state that we refer to them as uh, measures uh, five and uh, 50. Um, and uh, they actually had rolled back um, the valuations and then started raising them 3% every year. And so you'll have uh, two houses on the same street um, where uh, one is paying, you know, we actually have a house that pays $42 a year in, in property taxes. Um, and then when you divide that out, the city actually only gets roughly about 42 cents on the dollar. Everybody thinks it comes to the city and it doesn't. Um, and so it, um, uh, if you get on the council and you go through the budget meetings, um, you get really educated that um, these 13 million plus grants that we've brought in in the last uh, four years uh, is how we have gotten the city um, from being in fiscal stress. Yes, we have reserves, we're about five years out, but, but we are, uh, staff professionally takes suggestions to the council um, in order to maintain that stress and try to roll out the trajectory of our costs and our expenses as they continue. So thanks, great question. Um, Melinda, do you have a question, another? No. Okay, Madam Mayor. Um, so I have a question that's more of a, maybe a code enforcement and it might, you can tell me if you'd rather me ask this in a different setting, um, but it is campaign related. Um, I think because of the current position that I'm in, I receive a lot of messages and phone calls over signs that are 
in areas that um, violate where the signage could go, oh, even on okay. the building. So Amazing. I'm going to let you handle that one because you, you put together the memo. Um, are you good with answering that? Mm, partly. I know that they can't be in... Uh, Rob can help you out. Yeah, yes. I usually send them to, to Derek. To okay. Let me see if I can. Ralph, you want to... So there's two basic issues. One, they can't be on public property. So public property gets a little confusing. Um, and if you follow the state rules, they can't actually be invisible or visible from a state highway. Can't be state, visible from them? Not just on state highway property, but they can't be visible because they're, they're they haven't been enforcing it. We've just got that lately from oh, okay. the, the local access manager that, uh, and Stephanie has run into that. <laughs> okay, um, right. even, even with our banners yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for July Jubilee or anything else, unless it's permitted, you can get a permit, but they don't seem to be enforcing that. They do seem to be enforcing um, if you're actually on state highway right away. And the difference, and there, here's where it gets a little bit confusing, is city right away in almost all instances is an easement. It's not city <laughs> property <clears throat> state highway in almost all instances not 100 percent um is fee title they bought it by deed they purchased that right away so 101 most of 101 is purchased right away or it's city right away but most of it's purchased what i call dead man's corner everybody calls it that but it's sherman i mean newmark broadway corner um, is purchased by the state. That's all state highway right away. Most of Broadway and Newmark, most city streets, when you think of it in this aspect, um, are 60 foot right of ways, most of them. The streets, and if they're sidewalks, both sides takes up about 40 feet of that. The average person's physical property line starts somewhere between 10 and 12 feet behind the sidewalk or curb. Seven, I'm going to say seven feet behind the sidewalk, and if there's no sidewalk, 12 foot behind the curb. That's a pretty good guess. Enforcement wise, I'll be honest, we're not going to be out there and worrying about it. Most of the state highway stuff, Broadway, Newmark, Virginia, the right of ways within a foot of the back of the sidewalk. If you're five feet behind the curb or sidewalk other than state highway we're pretty and other than in front of city property and i can give you examples of major city property we have problems with every year we usually on dead man's curb which is state highway have issues um, we own across from kenware the entire marsh area there so that is city public property you can put signs in public property that is public property from basically Edgewood on the north edge of, uh, I mean, on the east edge of Kenware to in front of the Coke, I mean, the bottle drop is city property, that marsh area. It blends into Kingsview Christian, but, uh, and we also, in, Tom Gajewski owns a piece in front of that, and then kind of that bare area up the hill above that, about half of that's Gajewski and half of that city property. If it's in front of city property, we will take your sign. We'll photograph it. We'll let you know we took it. We'll put it in the street department for you to pick up. We don't want it to be doing this, so please don't put them at those locations because we own property throughout the city. But those are the major places because Newmark's a major traffic street. Um, but technically, and that's what makes it a little loose because the property owner has underlying rights for the right of way if the city's not using it. So technically it's both, we have the first right of use, but keep it five feet back from the edge of the street if in any right of way if you can. Um, obviously, and ask permission of the property owners because technically it's their property, it's their right. So okay. In respect of time, thank you, Ralph. 
Um, on our website, I, we have a, uh, a link says important update on political campaign signs in North Bend. I think Macy sent out. The rule of thumb, as Ralph says, is figure out whose property it is and get the proper permission. Um, we we have this. This is something I started when I came here uh, four years ago. Um, uh, I believe in code compliance, not enforcement. Um, there's no good to go over and do whack a moles um, because um, as I started this session, I said you don't know what you don't know, or if it's news, it's news to me. The reality is most folks don't know code. Um, that's why we try to, you know, the, you do things. And it's like, oh, I needed a permit. I didn't know. Um, and so uh, we, we try to take the compliance. And so we are complaint based. So if there's an issue, a concern, um, and yes, we've gotten several sign complaints that have come in. There's a form on our website. People fill it out. Um, code complaints are anonymous. Um, so all, all code com enforcement. Um, so when they come in, they're anonymous um, and they go over to code enforcement immediately. Anyone that uses that form, depending on what they select, it goes to whatever department. I get copied, so I see everything that comes in um, and we follow up. But um, just know that, um, yeah, it's high campaign season. Um, and um, the biggest reason is our workers are working in the right of ways. Um, and when we're out mowing, our folks have to stop and pick up every single one of the signs if they're in the right of way. Um, and so, and then ODOT and the police, it's about um, visual obstruction. We cannot treat campaign signs any different than any other sign. Meaning that the Supreme Court has said, a sign is a sign is a sign. So just, you know, so I hope that answers the question. That was sort of the round robin. Um, we only went over by an hour, imagine that. Um, so I told you I'd have you out by one, which it is, it's 2.01. Um, so I kept on my word. Um, uh, if you have additional questions, we'll hang around. I have my cards here, um, but I did want to take um, that group photo real quick. If you all guys um, uh, and gals, I say guys, that's a southernism, um, we'll gather for a photo. I appreciate it. Um, and then I want to thank you because you gave up two hours of your time um, to hopefully be better candidates out there and uh, uh, most importantly, be informed. So thank you. So. All right, so we'll just gather with the North Bend sign behind us. Does anybody need a card? Got my cell phone number on.